What do we learn if we put metaphorical margins into conversation with the poetic and experiential ways of being that Black women are interested in exploring? It's a question so important and so enduring that it commands a space of repetition. What do we learn if we put metaphorical margins into conversation with the poetic and experiential ways of being that Black women are interested in exploring? When I first encountered this line uh, from the second chapter of Dr. Catherine McKittrick's Demonic Grounds, Black Women and the Cartographies of Struggle, it changed my world. It was one of many from Dr. McKittrick's work that demonstrated for me the shapes that in inspired scholarship can take, the ground that it can cover, all it can do and be. What do we learn if we put metaphorical margins into conversation with the poetic and experiential ways of being that Black women are interested in exploring? In this line, as in Dr. McKittrick's work, the theoretical itself shares space and skin with the poetic, as metaphorical margins are called on to speak in concert with creative expression so that both may be pulled to the terrain of a spatial and material life defined not only by centers and borders, but by the landscapes of Black women's intellects, bodies, and imaginaries. McKintrick leads us to and through these geographies, specifically through Black women artists come, quote, explorers, in whose hands whole social worlds are both created and made navigable, according not only to questions of empire and conquest, but to Black feminist interest in, in a Black woman being. In this one quick sentence, McKittrick issues a statement, a query, and a provocation that has inspired new ways of thinking about the axes and coordinates of Black womanhood and about political, poetic, and bodily life. Catherine McKittrick is Associate Professor of Gender Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Her research is interdisciplinary and attends to the links between Black studies, theories of anti-colonialism and liberation, and creative texts. She also researches the writings of Sylvia Winter, with part of this work put forth in the edited collection Sylvia Winter on Being Human as Praxis. She authored Demonic Grounds, Black Women and the Cartographies of Struggle, and co-edited with Clyde Woods, Black Geographies uh, and the Politics of Place. She is currently working on a monograph, Dear Science and Other Stories. She's editor at Antipode, a, a radical journal of geography, and co-edits uh, the Science and Humanities Research, I'm sorry, and co-edits co with uh, the Duke University Press series, Erin Trees. She has twice been awarded the Social Science and Humanities Research Council Insight Grant, along with many other honors. Of Demonic Grounds, Sylvia Winter says, quote, Catherine McKittrick rejoins and initiates the completion of uncompleted challenges originally made from the perspective of the global anti-colonial, anti-imperial struggles, as well, of the anti, as well as of the anti-apartheid and other movements in the 60s. In its charting of a black feminist geography, its black feminist interrogations of science and biopolitics, and its reorienting of these geographies fiercely and determinedly around black women's art, Dr. McKittrick has literally changed the game of several fields and brought in the terrain on which these games of our discourse can be played. Speaking for myself and for many others of us in the room, I can say that Dr. McKittrick's work has expanded the landscapes of our own thinking and we're pleased and fortunate to share space with her today. Join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine McKittrick. Thank you for that beautiful, um, beautiful introduction. Um, and as Amelia said, I wish I could just drop my kiss. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Mecca. Um, I also want to um, just do a few other, make a few comments before I get into the, the paper. Thank you, Priscilla, um, Kim, and uh, everyone else who has um, brought me around this space, um, taken me from point A to point B, um, including Nick Spark, who went, took me to Target so I could get hair products they don't have in Canada, <laughs> um, which was great. So thank you, um, Nick, so much for that. Um, 
Uh, I also um, just want to uh, quickly note um, that the Global Blackness uh, Conference is going on at the same time. And if you know me, you know that geography matters. Um, and even though we're at, on different parts of the campus, we are still having similar conversations that are going on there. So I just want to um, just, just note that that's also happening at the same time and that we should, we should think about that um, a lot. And if I could, yeah, if I could just quickly, my PowerPoint is my bibliography, so it's just going to cycle through um, some texts that I implicitly or explicitly uh, talk about in this piece um, are up there or, and work that has inspired me um, and, and has allowed me to, to think about these, some, these kinds of questions. So my talk is um, called A Black Sense of Place on Algorithms and Curiosities. I'm going to start with two guide quotes. Never stop the action, keep it up, keep it up. Grace Jones. The second guide quote, their respective truths had necessarily come to function as an objective set of facts for the people of that society, seeing that such truths were now the indispensable condition of their existence as such a society, as such people, as such a mode of being human. These truths had therefore both commanded obedience and necessitated the individual and collective behaviors by means of which each such order and its mode of being human were brought into existence, produced, and stably reproduced. Sylvia Winter. In March, in March uh, 2014, Harper's Magazine published the report, Chronicle of a Death Foretold. In this piece, Monte Reed describes a program implemented by Chicago schools in 2009 that would, quote, determine exactly which of their 400,000 students would get shot. The program became known alongside an initiative called the Culture of Calm. Consultants from MIT and University of Chicago developed an algorithm that scanned juvenile detention and school attendance records, as well as test scores, and used these ar archives to prognosticate the preventable death of youths. When I first came ac across this report, I could not read past the first page. The report begins Apologies. The, port, the report begins with uh, Devant Flanoy, a young man who was, excuse me for using uh, an awkward non-word, uh, Flanoy was algorithmed. More specifically, self-contained and finite datum were pulled from Flanoy's archival file, and this led to interpretable, interpretable paper scores. In the application of the algorithm, his well-being and his psychic and biologic life were rendered in excess of a deterministic set of discursive calculations. Put simply, the algorithm mathematically refused all aspects of his livingness. Flanoy's archive, his records, his test scores, were culled and collated, and he was determined to be highly killable or ultra-high risk. Indeed, in many ways, his life only enters the mathematical equation as death. The algorithm was granted more energy and vitality through the act of application than Flanoy. After the predictive al system algorithmically anticipated his death and measures were taken to prevent his death, Flanoy was killed in June 2012. This report sat on my desk for just over two years and I read the first page over and over. I could not fully integrate into my psyche the idea of an algorithm that was manufactured to assume anticipate, predetermine, and foretell de deadly violence. At the same time, I did not want to consume yet again what I and we already know. And so I read that first page over and over for about two years, noticing that the compulsion to repeat put me in a state, as Dina Georgis argues, of simultaneously not wanting to forget and not wanting to know. When I returned to the report and completed reading it, I learned that the predictable algorithmic model saw both funding cuts and ineffectual results. The key to the program was to run the algorithm, identify high-risk people, and prevent their deaths by providing them with mentors who would support, teach, and counsel the youths. This cost about 15K US per student annually, and the funding model was unsustainable. As well, Gunshot victimization did not decrease among the algorithmed. 
Soon after, a similar predictable analytics formula was adopted by the Chicago Police Department, one that we are all familiar with and refer referred to as, predicti as, predictive, uh, as a predictive policing model. This algorithm identifies a series of hot spots and hot lists uh, that single out criminals and their attendant geographies. So I begin this talk with the Harper's Report not because what is uncovered is new or astonishing, but because it shows how blackness and race are implicit to mathematical codes, discourses, and problems. This report, without reserve, situates black youths in the midst of what Barnard Harcourt calls accutorial predictions. The predictions, the hot spots, the ultra high risk youths, for example, the predictions emerge from mechanical combining of information for classification purposes. The question of why or how or under what conditions premature death is predictable is not asked. Instead, death, or more aptly in Sylvia Winter's terms, diselection, is an analytical and methodological variable in the overall equation. Even the underfunded and defunded program, which was intended to save black life and engender mentorship, grimly assumed loss. The vulnerable were not given life, they were given foreseeable death. For the two years the report sat on my desk unread, I thought about the mathematics of black life. I wrote a paper where I wanted to centralize black life rather than preventable and premature uh, death. That paper argues in a less than straightforward way that one way to imagine black life differently is to rethink the mathematics that underwrite slave archives. Following Sadia Hartman's, uh, Sadia Hartman's Venus in Two Acts, I explore how archives document and institutionalize sexist anti-black practices. I argue that because the archives primarily document instances of violence toward and the death of black enslaved people, Anti-blackness acts as an eerie origin story that can steer us analytically as people who are studying these, these ideas toward death. What the archive tells us is what we already know and what we resist, what the archive already tells us is what we already know and what we resist. And it can also structure and frame how we enter into the present and future in our writing. Middle Passage and plantation systems formalized and made mundane in writing and in practice violence against black people, black subordination and racism. And we sometimes use this as a blueprint to understand and struggle against oppression. Anything in excess of violence, anti-black racism and subordination, for example, black life, black joy, the practice of loving, is either absent or perversely tied to the dehumanizing logics of white supremacy. My central questions for that paper were, if the archive is a knowledge network that records and normalizes black subordination, how do we understand this network outside of itself? What happens to our understanding of black humanity when our analytical frames do not emerge from a broad swathe of numbing racial violence, but instead from multiple and untracked enunciations of black life? So what I want to think about here, in a similar but different way, is how black life is absent from the classificatory algorithms that are applied to statistically organize our world. This absence affirms how, we, how, premature, how the premature death of black people, and more broadly, the diselection of the world's most vulnerable communities, is entrenched in algorithmic equations. What I'm struggling to think about then is twofold that premature death is an algorithmic variable, and that black life is outside algorithmic logics altogether. It follows that the coded infrastructures and patterns that, that are instituted to name and or resolve social problems can be anti-black, and as well that we are already grasping an alternative knowledge system um, where, when, we, when we analytically privilege black life. I'm not, I want to underline, suggesting that we replace the dead with the living. I'm not seeking to dismiss our losses. I want instead to, re to reimagine blackness as life and afterlife and whatever is in between as emerging from a black sense of place. So my concern is therefore broadly methodological. How do we come to and formulate answers and what do we want from these solutions politically? How might a black sense of place rethink the demand to fix and repair black humanity that employs a strategy of, of lifting people, black people up 
um, and pulling them from the category of subhuman to a genre of human that cannot bear black life. So that's the Fanonian question. Um, what if black life methodologically and practically opens up question marks and unanswerable curiosities? A black sense of place draws attention to geographic processes that emerged from plantation slavery and its attendant racial violences, yet cannot be contained by the logics of white supremacy. A black sense of place is not a standpoint or situated knowledge. It is, an, it is a location of difficult encounter and relationality. A black sense of place is not individualized knowledge, it's collaborative praxis. It assumes our collective assertions of, of life are always in tandem with other ways of being, including those we, ways of being that we cannot bear. A black sense of place always calls into question, struggles against, critiques, undoes prevailing racial scripts. A black sense of place is a diasporic, plantocratic black geography that reframes what we know by re-honoring, by reorienting and honoring where we know from. This is a place to borrow from Edward Glissant, where analytic thought is led to construct unities whose interdependent variancies jointly piece together the interactive totality. A black sense of place is a, is a methodology and an analytic frame that believes in and believes black humanity. So I ask, what does a black sense of place do to algorithms that presume in advance black diselection? How, how might we shift our methodological questions so that we do not end up in an analytical bind that affirms rather than undoes racial violence? A black sense of place then illuminates uncomfortable re relationalities, yet understands these as a method through which we can wade through the horrific uneasiness of black diselection that is, as we know, posited as an easy plantoc plantocratic resolution to a vast range of social problems. What I also want to gesture to as I move through this discussion um, are how some geographies are called up as answers to problems. Put simply, solving crimes often involves surveying and marking black and or impoverished geographies and claiming that this is not profiling because places rather than people are being targeted. What I want to think about is how social problems that are resolved through producing calculations, equations, and problem-solving operations are cartographically itemized uh, racial codes. So part of our project then is to notice how algorithms have a place and take place and produce place and how blackness, where we know from, understands and reorders these geographies. I also focus on geography to dislodge crude identity politics to cast the net beyond the individual and to emphasize that where we know from, rather than what we already know about our seemingly authentic selves, um, so where we know from is a more generous and difficult project than, is, is more generous and difficult project that, when at its best, takes into account interhuman geographies. With this in mind, I want to suture a black sense of place to these kinds of mathematics and problem-solving practices in order to unthink the violent production of space. So to turn to algorithms. An algorithm applies to any mathematical procedure consisting of an indefinite number of steps, each step applying to the one preceding it. These steps are, in fact, massive calculations that are set up to accomplish a task. Most algorithms stop upon finding the answer. So my, my learning from, um, about algorithms comes from the Khan Academy, for those who want to know. <laughs> but I'll get to that later. Um, according to Khan Academy, the reason algorithms matter is because the massive calculations, quote, do things people care about. Algorithms are best known within the context of computer science, an area of study that is very unfamiliar to me. Um, but they are attached to longer practices of statistical data collection. The aforementioned hotspots, hot lists, and risky people were the result of computer algorithms as are trending hashtags, credit application scores, job application scores, prison sentencing decisions, publication impact factors, Netflix and Amazon recommendations, and so on. So these computer-generated algorithms might best be described as automated decision-making software. 
They are computer codes that are given a problem that seek and compile that then seek and compile patterns and themes and spit out solutions. An important feature underlying many algorithms is predictability. They are not only used to work out problems, they know that they, they know that problem in advance and are tasked to achieve a specified result. So the accomplishment, the, the answer, the result, what we care about comes before the equation. An important example of this predictive algorithm, an important example of this is predictive algorithm models. In his study of policing and profiling, Harcourt explores the predictive parole models alongside the overlapping fields of sociology, criminology, and statistics. Beginning roughly in the 1930s, statistical information on prisoners, such as immigrant, immigrant status, employment history, personality type, characteristic traits, were gathered to determine the likelihood of repeat offenses. I don't want to spend too much time rehashing Harcourt's study, although it's really interesting for the ways in which um, um, race and blackness guarantee the entire project, but are totally under-theorized in the project. Um, rather, I want to signal that what these early statistical systems knew in advance was tied to characteristic traits, which ostensibly shape recidivism and other decisions about prison life. It is not news, of course, that characteristic traits are underpinned by differential racial histories and privileges. Um, what we learn from predictive algorithms, then, is that the mathematical answer or result is, at least in part and sometimes in whole, tied to a larger colonial and plantocratic logic. A trait is, as we know, a genetically determined characteristic, like eye color. Traits are the variables that underlie what Sylvia Winter calls a biocentric system of knowledge. So this is a system of knowledge that assumes that we are totally and completely biological beings, rather than humans who are um, what I call, using one word, physiological story makers. So in contemporary context, sometimes race is written into the predictive formula. So a violence prediction model variable counts and assesses African American, Hispanic, sc school per capita shooting, times shot previously, serious misconducts per day, math score, reading score, percentage of days suspended, percent of days absent, and so on. Sometimes race is absent from the predictive formula. A risk terrain model counts and assesses drug arrests, gang, territory, at-risk at housing, risky facilities, shootings, gun robberies, and so on. With that in mind, Predictive algorithms and accutorial patterns did and still do rely on genetic variables to help solve problems and get results and do things people care about. Um, as well, we should note that the characteristic traits that underlie early algorithms get coded over and coded over and coded over so that the variables within the original equation that was fashioned to do things we care about, the trait variables, sometimes get weighed down and lost underneath mathematical ciphers. This weight also hides the work of the, co the, work of the coders and translators those workers who fuel algorithms by collecting and collating data, yet remain unseen and unacknowledged. Those workers, Adonaski and Vora write, are the surrogate technologies whose labor facilitates the ease of coming to an algorithmic conclusion. Importantly, the work and process of coding conceals a long biocentric statistical history that continues to define traits, our genetic characteristics, as variables. A variable is a symbol that represents a quantity in a mathematical expression. What unfolds are measurable numbers, often abstracted from human input, calculating resolutions that we care about. If we understand algorithms in this vein, we can begin to tease out how numbers and mathematical equations are tied to a biocentric system of knowledge. What becomes increasingly clear then is not simply that the results and answers are racist, for example, your traits mathematically result in your incarceration, but that the work of administering algorithms, what we do to solve problems that we care about, requires biocentric methods and methodologies that can only produce dehumanizing mathematical results. This is to say that black inhumanity, specifically the biocentric racist claim that black people are not human and unevolved and already dead and dying, 
is a variable in the problem solving equation before the question is asked which means that the work of the algorithm to do things people care about, to accomplish the task, already knows that Flannoy's life and well-being are extraneous to its methodology. What comes into clear view then is not simply the racist result, but the administrative and methodological steps that require racism before they begin. There has been a flurry of recent articles and books that speak to these themes particularly in relation to predictive policing, but also in relation to other algorithmic patterns. Uh, pred predictive algorithms are racist. Predictive algorithms imitate a racist system. Predictive algorithms are technologies of racial profiling. Predictive algorithms are anti-black. Algorithms harm communities of color. Algorithms threaten democracy. I subscribe to the algorithm page on Flipboard, which algorithmically gathers a range of recommended articles on big data and algorithms and presents them to me because I care about algorithms. <laughs> Recent headlines include beauty contest regrets using robots for judges after only white people win. Um, Facebook algorithms can't replace good judgment. Algorithm can accurately mimic human voices, including breathing how algorithms can destroy your chance of getting a job, and slaves to algorithm, can coders create a dance floor banger? In a television series I watch, um, and there's a clue up here as to which television series that is, um, in the television series I watch, which was rec recommended to me by the Netflix algorithm and will remain unnamed, a corporate banker says, and I'm paraphrasing, algorithms are my life. I need algorithms to survive. The widely circulated and important ProPublica article, Machine Bias, draws attention to how the software and formulas used to determine future criminals is racially biased. Regardless of their criminal history, a history which may include no criminal activity at all, black people are riskier than white people. We, all, we also know as well that there's widespread support for predictive models, which are described as beneficial, proactive, promising, strikingly successful, cost-effective, incredibly accurate, and so on. These incredibly accurate algorithms are all are also often posited as delinked from race, thus pushing up against the ProPublica thesis. For example, PredPol, the leader in predictive policing software, has a, set, has, has, a web, has a website that reads, quote, PredPol uses only three data points in making predictions, past type of crime, place of crime, and time of crime. It uses no personal information about individuals or groups of individuals, eliminating any personal liberties and profiling concerns. In some of the studies I read, there are often short definitions of what a predictive algorithm is or what predictive policing algorithms are, but the racial contours behind the numbers are often non-existent. The already existing biocentric logics um, Excuse me. Yeah, the already existing biocentric logic does not necessarily inform the administration of the algorithm. How we get to what we care about is not relevant. What is highlighted and discussed are the answers. Finding bad, risky geographies and disciplining the bad, risky people that inhabit these places. This kind of analytical move refuses to acknowledge the role of racial capitalism and white, the role racial capitalism and white supremacy play in policing practices while positing the results, which are basically um, produced or, or sort of celebrated as beneficial acts of disselection. So um, it does, refuses to acknowledge the role of racial capitalism and white supremacy in policing practicing while positing that the results are objective truths. Samuel Greengard writes, feed reams of data, particularly data focus, focused on time, distribution, and geography of past events into a database and ferret out patterns that would not be apparent to the human eye or brain. With the resulting data, it is possible to adjust patrols and other resources to create a stronger deterrent, but also to predict where crimes are likely, likely to be placed take place and be in a better position to apprehend suspects. So what I'm trying to work through is then how 
the racist biocentric logics that inform algorithmic queries and their answers are quietly yet securely tied to a mathematics of black lifelessness. What we have is a system wherein black people are dehumanized in advance, and this process is hardened and made objective by mathematical codes. The tensions between these analytical approaches, so the biological and the mathematical, function to produce a series of objective facts precisely because they are grounded in a positivist system of knowledge that inde indexes simultaneously racial, sexual, economic, geographic, and, and other differences. The algorithm expresses almost perfectly the brutality of racism precisely because it is an accounting system that produces what Sylvia Winter calls adaptive truth for terms that are specific to our present order of consciousness. The numbers that, become, that come before, comprise, and complete the algorithm are devoid of black life, yet filled up with acts of black diselection. It is a process typical to what we already know. A biocentric system is mathematically confirmed. It unfolds and is, and is, in theory, seemingly absent of racism because the methodology cannot comprehend black well-being in the first place. The system and the methodologies cannot bear black livingness and the math and the coding behind the algorithm provide an alibi for racism because black life is not relevant to the things people care about. What is revealed is a tendency to bifurcate uh, the science of the biological and the science of mathematics as well. Even though we know in our hearts algorithms imitate a racist system, within our present system of knowledge, the, the numbers do not and cannot lie. Josh Chanel adds to this by exploring how algorithms are real social processes that enshrine contested neo-plantation systems of rule as technocratic abstractions, infrastructural and inevitable. The information behind algorithms is cast as spectral data bodies that produce a matrix of prehension that is spatially enacted. Indeed, if the numbers cannot lie, the spatialization of these numbers expressed across multi-scalar geographies ensure what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls the fatal couplings of power and difference signified by racism. Geography matters because it functions to illuminate how algorithmic answers to our problems, what we care about, are embedded in place. And interestingly, the more we research these connections between geography and algorithms, the more we notice how the former geography is a code for race or blackness. Predictive algorithms are not only imitating a racist system, they are refusing an already refused black humanity by marking black geographies as predictably criminal. In many ways, then, the answer to our problems is revealed as the multi-scalar dispossession of the already dispossessed. This geographic layer perfects the algorithmic alibi by using mathematical procedures to abstract human activity from anti-black or racist problem-solving practices and by depersonalizing black geographies. Credpol, to quote from then again, using only three data points, past type, place and time of crime, and a unique algorithm based on criminal behavior patterns, Predpol's powerful so software provides each law enforcement agency with customized crime predictions for the places and times that these crimes are most likely to occur. Predpol, pin Predpol pinpoints small areas de depicted 500 feet by 500 feet boxes on maps that are automatically generated for each shift each day. So in addition to studies like machine bias that I mentioned earlier, there has been some important work on reclaiming and recoding algorithms rec and recognizing coders who are not invested in or refuse predictive models. Um, highlight and highlighting non so that there's a high, there are folks that are highlighting non-predictive uh, algorithms or eternal algorithms that go on forever. There, be, there are people thinking about the algorithm as similar to the code noir or as a form of plantation neoliberalism or as enacting a Foucauldian panopticon. There are algorithmic poetics and code work that indexes different modes of safety and violence. There have also been uh, algorithmic mappings of negritude, slave ship routes, city sounds, deaths since Ferguson, and more. 
So even though the numbers do not lie, many are working hard to counter code or re-narrate or simply tell the certainties that underlie the brutal statistics, traits, and mathematics of diselection. What all of this has led me to, so the codes and the recodes, the equations, the problems, the, the predictions and the spatial alibis, the software and the numbers all covered in blood and death and things we care about that would not otherwise be apparent to the eye or the brain is a lesson in methodology. I'm interested in algorithms because, what, because of what they tell us about how we do things we care about. I've been talking a lot about how many algorithms are future-making mathematic equations. They are anticipatory computations that tell us what we already know, but in the future. If we want a different or better or more just futures, it's important to notice what kind of knowledge networks are already predicting our futures. As we know as well, futurity, I can never say it, futurity, Futurity and futures are deeply man meaningful to black folks. We see this playing out in a number of ways, in reconceptualizations of time and place, in Afrofuturisms, in black science fictions and speculative fictions, in the unmet promises of modernity, in the freedom yet to come. We see it in the syllabi and the calls for papers and the conferences and the books and the articles and the blogs. We see it in the key words and in the museums in the recent and not so recent, all, uh, and not so recent at all, turn to string theory and theoretical physics and quantum mechanics and black studies. In the unending and open-ended circulation of the spectacles, the litanies, the lists of those we, you, and I have lost. In the lists we, can, we cannot bear to draw up. In the poems and the theories we write, the poems and theories we will not write on the streets and in the parks and around our tables and in our art worlds in a, and in our sighs and also in our side eyes, in our tiredness, in our dreams, in our, in, and in the demand to keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. So if algorithms are future-making mathematical equations, they matter to black studies because they are predicated on the negation of black life. This negation demands that we keep it up because we cannot live with the knowable future our present system of knowledge has given us. This negation also highlights boldly that black life is rebelling against that system of negation precisely because it is unimaginable within the practice of automated decision making. What I want to underline is that if algorithms provide a generalized template that require the absolute negation of black humanity, and black life is in excess of the self-replicating system, then the equations, algorithms, and the big data cannot actually adapt to black life. This opens up a methodological opportunity for us because algorithms signal that what is outside this and other systems of big knowledge, black life, black well-being, black livingness, black joy, is a genre of humanness that is poised to decode or is already decoding the system and at the same time enunciating a worldview that functions as what Sylvia Winter calls a new science of human discourse. These are the demonic grounds that Winter writes about in her beautiful piece on The Tempest, a different and alternative time space, a black sense of place where we know from that can and does reorder our present system of knowledge because it is not, as we have been told over and over again, measurable on colonial terms. So part of what I'm suggesting sounds like and is a monumental winter-esque demand um, to reorder how we know and to produce a new science of human discourse. But I think it's a meaningful and urgent demand. We might engender black, black life as, as methodology human being as praxis coupled with diasporic interdisciplinarity that cannot be measured or pinned down. Winter's monumental demand can therefore be grasped on a smaller scale by posing new and different academic questions that emerge from a black sense of place. What happens to our questions if we insist our methodologies are in themselves forms of black well-being? What happens if the unmeasurability of black life is indicative of and necessary to our analytics? What if we are not seeking outputs and answers and conclusions that will somehow end racism within our present system, system of knowledge? What if the answers that emerge from our colonial and plantocratic blueprints are not good enough? What if there is not a learning outcome? Please. <laughs> 
What if we taught and wrote not as problem solvers who count and assess variables, and here I, I, I include creative texts that can sometimes be theorized as variables. What if we taught and wrote as problem solvers, not as problem solvers who count and assess variables, but as intellectuals who believe in with all our hearts, opacity, and giving on and with, rather than finding, grasping, and having? The answers that emerge from our colonial pasts are not good enough, precisely because they are given in advance of the questions. If the depth and richness of our lives are absent from our analytics, if our questions rehearse what we already know, we risk working with and reproducing a system that cannot adapt to black life. This positions the algorithm not as something we should abandon, but as a warning sign that signals the limits and possibilities of how we do what we do. The features of the algorithm are disquieting and familiar because it is a system that looms over and under the disciplining methodologies that make the academy what it is. The question, the answer, the massive calculations that are set up to accomplish a task, the push to, the push to solve problems correctly and efficiently. I'm not arguing that, this, that the algorithm is the same methodologically as, say, discourse analysis or text-based analysis or participant observation or other methodological processes we employ to do what we do. I'm suggesting that our academic worlds celebrate problem solving, learning outcomes, and accomplishments and reviews and mandates, and in the case of my university, it's called master plans. Um, and that these features often lurk behind our questions. I'm wondering how we might shift our focus to embrace more, more boldly and confidently an analytics of black life. What happens when we centralize black life and humanity, not eschewing racism and racial violence, but rather understanding these practices as brutally relational to what it means to be human? So the, the last part of my paper um, is called The Confession, um, uh, and it's, it's, it's just a few, a few more minutes of your time. Um, so The Confession. Uh, when I was writing this paper, I stopped several times because I didn't want to finish it. I felt tired and defeated, and in fact, I hated my argument, and I came to despise algorithms. <laughs> I realized that the work of coding and the practical science of computer science was impenetrable and unwelcoming to a person who has not been trained in this discipline. I hated what I wanted to know and why I wanted to know it because it was unintelligible to me. I am not a computer scientist. Everything that I read, everything that, I read that was in fact intelligible, the articles and books that spelled out how algorithms are undemocratic and racist, simply affirmed anti-blackness. They didn't take me anywhere new, and at the same time gave me a future I did not want. I didn't know anything, yet I knew something. The only transparency for me, a non-computer scientist, was premature and preventable death. I also resented the context through which I and we are writing and thinking, normalized racial violence, the lists of the dead and the dying, the same old thing, rampant textuality coupled with excessive, unspeakable violence that lends, leads us on a linear path to a future of unfreedom. The reason I'm confessing anger and frustration is because I adore and believe with all my heart in radical interdisciplinarity, or after a discussion with Lisa Lowe, rogue interdisciplinarity maybe, um, as a way to rethink our present system of knowledge. The reason I originally turned to algorithms is because I wanted to think about how these mathematical equations organize our world. And I wanted to put them into conversation with creative texts that would perhaps take us somewhere new. What I also confronted during my research is that sometimes the seduction of what we do not know can take us so radically outside our own sense of place that we lose sight of why we do the work we do. Part of my confession, then, is that I do not really know, in a confident academic sense, how algorithms are made. I'm still learning. Like my interest in physics, um, I, learn, I learned a lot and continue to learn, um, but not really enough to unsettle both physics and blackness. I am not a physicist, um, nor am I a geographer. What I learned from my research on computer science, um, for the most part, was the outcome. What I 
I came to despise the work because my interdisciplinary project was foiled by what I did not know and what I could not know as a non-computer science scholar of the humanities. I tried to make up my own algorithm and I failed. Um, then I had this grand idea, idea to algorithmically mash up what I wrote here with something that Fred Moten sent me. Yeah, that's a name drop. Um, uh, that Fred Moten sent me. I wanted to produce an endless list three columns actually, this was how I envisioned it in my mind, an endless list of scrolling words that come from two different senses of places in three different ways. I couldn't do it. I, I did not know how to write the code to do it. Defeated, the most I could bear was to input the words from this talk into one of those word cloud generators. I felt sick to my stomach. Those word clouds are promotional narratives, part of the master plan for my university. Gender in large block letters, woman in smaller letters, queer in tiny letters, international in medium letters, and black nowhere. I became an am, I, I became an am offended and sickened by the word cloud. So I've settled on learning about Brian Eno's generative music model and going from there and I'll let you know what happens with that. Um, but all of this led me to something I already know but keep returning to in a kind of compulsive and uh, repetitive way in my work. To do radical interdisciplinary work from a black sense of place that changes the kinds of questions we ask is not just about reading outside our discipline, uh, researching and using slices and terms from scholars we do not normally read, it is about sharing ideas comprehensively and moving these ideas to new contexts and places. In the longer version of this paper, I ask that we read creative texts as theoretical texts. I ask what happens if the novel or the song is the theoretical frame. For this part of the project, I checked in with my partner Zilli, who is a musician and a coder. When I told him what I wanted to do to learn how to code, to create an algorithm that shows that predictive policing algorithms are not the only ways of knowing or doing black geographies, to learn how algorithms might be made into something new or different, he told me that was not the right project to do. More specifically, he asked me, what, what do you want the algor algorithm to exactly do? And I, actually, and I could not formulate an answer. We had many, many conversations about the back end of algorithms and how the politics of algorithms, even the endless algorithms, are demands, for a clear, are demands for clear and clean answers. They always already know. We also talked about Markov chains and Alan Turing and AI and Minority Report. Um, what I learned from learning about algorithms is that the questions I ask in my own research emerge from difficult and often unbearable encounters. These encounters are riddled with impatience and are endless repetitive burdens that are ongoing and never resolved. I learned that I wanted something I could not get from an algorithm because all it could provide was a predetermined codified answer. I also learned that there's a sexiness to algorithms. Imagine I fantasized if I could actually code a poetic politics of blackness and show it to everyone at Duke. <laughs> so my conversations with Zilli led me down an important path because I came to understand that not knowing what an algorithm is in an academic sense opened up bigger questions about how we come to know blackness in an academic sense. I began to dwell on praxis and methodology and to think differently about the production of knowledge in relation to race. The encounter did not produce a sexy coder with, a se with sexy codes, it produced an unfinished mess and a messed up person who continues to be deeply suspicious of how we come to know, where we know from, and the ways in which so many academic me methodologies refuse black life. But the conversation with Zilli is, is what I wanna underscore. For if we are to re reorient our analytics and privilege black life, as we practice radical or rogue interdisciplinarity, we must engage deeply in conversation and share our ideas generously. This is to say that relationality, like a black sense of place, must be praxis, a praxis that does not assume or, or, assume or desire resolved outcomes. I'm arguing, that paying co I'm arguing that paying close attention to drawing out and forging relational knowledges will provide us, 
As academics and thinkers who are invested in undoing the normalized working of anti-blackness and other forms of violence, with the analytical mechanisms that allow us to do anti-colonial work in a variety of university settings that, as we know, were not built to support or recognize marginalized communities and intellectuals. So part of our intellectual task, then, is to work out how different kinds and types of texts, voices, and geographies relate to each other and open up unexpected and surprising ways to talk about liberation, knowledge, history, race, gender, narrative, and blackness. The liberatory task is not to measure and assess the unfree and seek consolation in naming violence, um, but rather posit that many divergent and different and relational voices of unfreedom are analytical and intellectual sites that can tell us something new about our academic concerns and our anti-colonial futures. So this paper is a very, very long plea to be uncomfortably okay with the unmeasurability of black life and to engender interhuman relationalities with all our heart. It is a plea to practice uh, rogue interdisciplinarity without fraying its connection to black life. It's a plea to honor a black sense of place, where we know from, rather than mobilizing crude identity politics as the answer and the fix. It's a plea to keep it up and a plea to foster intellectual spaces, sometimes crammed into the corners of the academy, sometimes not, for and with each other in order to be, in, in order to methodologically and analytically redefine what they want us to be. Thank you.